Wrestling Federation, here is a man that has not only turned it around 180 degrees, 180 degrees. but he's gone another 360 and another then 360. and then another 180. Macho Man Randy Savage. You have changed over the past couple of months like I can not believe, sir. I'm a chameleon, yeah. A chameleon? Uh, uh, yeah. I'm talking about the beat goes on, yeah. And the beat goes on, yeah. And the beat goes on. And the video scope, yeah, I am looking right into you right now. Macho Madness right now. Sugar is sweet and so is honey. Macho Madness is on a roll and it can't be stopped, no. Elizabeth understands what I'm talking about, yeah. What, what, uh, why is it, Macho Man, when I sit and talk to you, stand and talk to you for that matter, that I think of old Sonny and Cher hits? Why is that? Unbelievable. Time distortion. Space is the place me and Gene Okerlund go down that lonesome highway. Yeah, but don't be hypnotized, no. Reincarnation doesn't have to be. You can concentrate and you can uh, mental but, telepathy. But, yeah, but the beat goes on. But the beat goes on. That beat in particular has got to include... Maybe the honky-tonk man, the intercontinental champion of the world. I know you're not getting along real well with members of the Bobby Heenan family, Macho Man. Not at all. Let me tell you something right now. Talking about the greatest intercontinental champion that ever lived, the honky-tonk man is out of line. Yeah, because I am the greatest intercontinental heavyweight champion that ever lived, and I am the greatest professional wrestler that ever lived, and I'm living now. Yeah, right now. Uh -huh. You know, he makes no bones about making the proclamation that he is. I'm talking about the honky-tonk man, the greatest intercontinental champion of all time. He says I can't sing and I can't dance, but I can make romance. Yeah, right there. They're the fork in the road. I said go right. Elizabeth said go left. I went right. And then, and then, I understand what the situation was. I went over that one bridge, yeah. And then, when I crossed that bridge, I found out that I was on the right side. And I said, Elizabeth, follow me, yeah. Because I'm going straight to the top. The stars, yeah, the stars. One shining star in the night. Shining brighter than all the other ones and i'm talking light years away yeah you're talking macho madness yeah, macho madness yeah macho so. madness rolling yeah you thought so but i know so and macho madness is coming straight at you honky tonk man and the like yeah because i'm on a roll and i ain't stopping yeah elizabeth go right and i'm going left can i ask a question macho man no more questions i'm sorry about that macho man randy savage Hello and welcome to OSW Review, the old school wrestling podcast, chronicling the entire Hulkamania era in the WWF, pay-per-view by pay-per-view. We bring it live from the 80s, filmed in glorious grapple vision on Thanksgiving night, November 26, 1987. We're going to see Hulk Hogan lead his team against Andre the Giants. This is the 10-year countdown to Brett getting screwed <laughs> at the first ever Survivor Series. I actually want to have a quick word about just what's gone on since WrestleMania 3 because it has only been six months. Six but, months, yeah. But a lot has happened in between. Like, this is a, like, if you were to watch one pay per view and then the other, everything seems switched around. Like, so just a quick note on what happened since WrestleMania 3. With the massive success of WrestleMania 3, WWF would add three more pay per views to the yearly lineup, starting with November's Survivor Series. Previous to this, all TV fans had to go on with the Superstars tapings as most of WWF's time was spent on the house show circuit and, you know, the monthly MSG shows. Why November, anyway, for Survivor Series? Well, it was practically equidistant between WrestleManias, which is a great idea, and directly opposed to NWA's WrestleMania called Starcade, which had been running on pay-per-view every November since 1983. This might just be the height of McMahon's ruthless business tactics. Not only did he run the first ever Survivor Series on the same night as Starcade, oh, wow. he told pay-per-view providers that if they offered NWA Starcade, they would not get WWF Survivor Series and every WWF pay-per-view from then on. Most relented and Vince's strong arming worked and this severely gouged Starcade's profitability. 
two things happened. By next year, JCP was sold to Ted Turner and WCW was formed. Also, from next year on, 1988 till the year it finished in 2000, Starcade was moved to December. Direct competition by Vince McMahon there. That is fascinating, ruthless business acumen by Vince there. Um, I, you know, I'm sure there's plenty of people that think he's evil and he ruined the wrestling business, but I just think he's a great man. <laughs> I think what he did for the wrestling business, he took it out of the dingy hall to the, you know... 93,000 seater arena. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Like, uh, whatever we say bad about McMahon, the reason we're all wrestling fans is because of McMahon. Yeah. On screen as well, a lot has happened since WrestleMania 3. Steamboat, after winning the belt from Savage at WrestleMania 3, asked for some time off to be there for his pregnant wife. Vince said, all right, but six weeks is too long to pull the icy belt off the road. So Vince booked the belt to go on to Butch Reed instead. When he no-showed the event, Honky was given the spot and won in a massive upset as Honky was still a joke at the time and really strapped a rocket to his back. Oh, did not know that. What a time to no-show an event. That's eh? unbelievable. His guitar looked so much better than what Jeff Jarrett uses today. It actually looks like something that's real. As well as the Jeff Jarrett's looks like like chipboard or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I just like It just makes a big difference in getting the gimmick over as being more realistic. Mm, mm. Yeah. Post Mania 3, Savage had started turning face, wrestling against heels on the house show circuit. After Honky's icy title win, Honky declared himself the greatest ever and to forget about previous champions, including Macho, which Savage took offence to. Honky kept dodging a match with Savage until Saturday night's main event number 12 in October 87, where they faced off. Honky got himself DQ'd and the rest of Jimmy Hart's stable, which is Hart Foundation, came down and destroyed Randy. Honky Tonk Man actually smashed him with his guitar. It only made a dent in the guitar. It didn't yeah, it did, the whole thing didn't shatter like, mm. like with Jarrett's, you know? Even bigger, Liz was thrown down to the mat and went backstage as she was chastised by Heenan. And she came back with Hulk Hogan in hand. And Hogan came to Savage's rescue. And the crowd were going mental at this stage because they were wanting Savage to turn face. Savage extended a hand and Hogan reluctantly put it out. You know, the, you get a shot of their hand slowly going together and BAM! They shake hands and Savage's face turn is cemented. And awesome. here we go. It's the mega powers. Savage is looking to regain his lost intercontinental belt from Honky. By this point, uh, Steamboat was not only back from his vacay, but he was now on Savage's team. Also, what I point out, Steamer had been feuding with Jake Roberts when he first came into the WWF and all throughout 86 was on the team as well so uh, extremely affable and mellow baby face and teaming with all uh, his former enemies all right thanks for joining us tonight here it's just me jay hunter and v1 how's it going jay all right all right yeah a bit conspicuous by his accent by his accent <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, Niall is out on holiday in London with the missus, and Ook is just with the missus. Like. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we start Survivor Series. You got the uh, jazz sex music opening back. Uh, our commentators for tonight are Jesse Ventura and Gorilla Monsoon. Unfortunately, he didn't run down the rules until uh, they talked about Turkey for about 10 fucking minutes. <laughs> Okay, so the Survivor Series rules of elimination. Number one, by pinfall. Number two, submission. Number three, count out. Number four, DQ, which is all the same as a normal match. And number five, at the ref's discretion, pending injury. I saw this and I immediately thought future angle on this card. Uh, maybe that's me being the cynical wrestling fan that I am, but when I saw this, I thought that main event, they were, you know... Andre was going to injure Hogan and the ref was going to DQ him or something for it. Yeah. Let's go straight into it. So we get an interview with Honky's team. Uh, he recounts pushing Liz and lists off the member of his team quite quickly. I was well impressed. And his opponents. Uh, there's hard editing of the entrances. I watched the Silver Vision version. You, uh, WWE version, yeah. All right, so I think... I think it was a good 40 minutes longer than yours. Yeah, yeah mine's this time. just under two hours. I think this is where it went missing because I got like really hard en editing in the entrances. Sean Mooney, he was doing a voiceover saying, Ooh. this is a team member, this is a team member, this is a team member. And no, that definitely wasn't in there. Like, in so every entrance was cut a minute out of it, you know. Not only is there editing in the entrances, but they make multiple edits during the matches. Really, yeah. like, the, the whole uh, impacted flashes white yeah, thing? Yeah, Wow, that makes There's, me angry. I think they cut out the rest spot, so I'm fine with that, but there is one case where it's horrific. 
We actually Ooh. missed an elimination. <gasps> really? Oh, I can't wait to talk about that. <laughs> yeah, and uh, then we cut to uh, Mean Gene talking with uh, Macho's team. Yeah, which was <laughs> very funny because in the background, Ricky the Dragon Steamboat looked like a fucking retard. <laughs> he kept on doing this karate chops and little... I don't even know what to say them without sounding racist, but uh, I thought he looked like a gimp. And, uh, <laughs> just macho man was awesome. When when he finally came in, he stole the scene. He was great. And so match number one is Savage's team with Ricky Steamboat, Brutus the Barber Beefcake, Jake Roberts, and Jim Duggan. And they're taking on Honky's team with King Harley Race, Dangerous Danny Davis, Hercules Hernandez... And the outlaw. Rob Bass. <laughs> Overall, I thoroughly enjoyed this match. I thought it was very good. I thought that both teams were, you know, just a little uneven. Looking back on it, you know, you've got Macho, Steamboat, Hacksaw, Beefcake, Jake Roberts. They're like five, well, four, maybe, <laughs> maybe three of the great names of the 80s with, you know, Duggan and Beefcake thrown on top. But you've, you've got Honky, who's an awesome gimmick, but, like, Hercules, Danny Davies, Ron Bass, like... Yeah. Overall, I, I thought that they really pulled this match off and thought it was great. First thing I have to say is I can't emphasise enough how loud the crowd are. Yeah, they were up for it. They were up for everything. Shoulder block by the Herc, into the ropes again, look out, leapfrog, beautifully executed. Sleeper. And a sleeper, he's got it on him! absolutely mental like this popping for clotheslines yeah yeah holy shit like i i can't really can can you equate that to anything today like where a crowd was that loud probably you'd only get a four a match but not the whole night everyone is up for everything and they're into everything and that's what makes it special I, yeah, I, 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 I'll have to splice in some audio for this because it is mental, absolutely mental. Awesome. But once again, uh, Macho's team, the four lads came out first and they came out again to Dragon's theme song and just his original theme is so awesome that it just, it just kind of takes away a bit. And then Macho, of course, got his own entrance with his own theme. I have to start this off with Beefcake. Did you notice what he was wearing? It was a sexy attire. It was a sexy man's attire indeed. Uh, these happen to be the same pants <laughs> that he wore at both WrestleMania 2 and 3. Except each show he'd cut progressively more <laughs> out of them and added more lace or see-through. I love it. Yeah. Love it. So, uh, yeah, because... He truly um, is a barber then. Because <laughs> uh, at, at Mania 1, they were full tights, leopard print. At Mania 2, he'd bits of the thigh cut out. And he he pretty much half of his jocks cut out in this show. <laughs> it's a, what a gimmick. <laughs> Beefcake starts off hot. The crowd go crazy for him, getting the sleeper. Uh, steamer with a karate chop off the top. Skins the cat twice, which is pretty cool. Race looks awful next yeah, to the younger, fit totally. opponents. Uh, steamer and Savage are moving at a lightning pace. Duggan clotheslines race over the top and two brawl until they get counted out. So I was expecting a lot of this, like, because the 80s is renowned for kind of bullshit finishes, DQs, countouts, that kind of thing, you know? Yeah, I went out of my way to make them know that it was a great idea to get King Harley Race out of this match for us. He looked so old, so out of shape. Beefcake pins Bass after a high knee, which is quite impressive, really. Do you reckon uh, Harley Race had beef with him using that move? <laughs> <Gosh>. <laughs> Honky applies the armor, but BK does his version of hulking up. Did you see he was kind of strutting while he was in a sleeper? Really? It was like a mini hulk up, yeah. yeah. Wow, as I suppose they are mates like. Would you say he beefed up? God! <laughs> Did you notice that um, Monsoon called him the beefer throughout this whole match? <laughs> the beefer. Did you also notice how much uh, Ron Bass looked like Justin Hawk Bradshaw? Pretty good. Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. Um, looked in worse shape than yeah, Justin the state of them, like. um, Yep, so Honky hits a shake, rattle, roll, gets the three. So we're down to three versus three. I was wondering, like, how do we kind of review this? Because there's no real story in no. the match beyond how many is left in the team, you know? Well, this match kind of 
different characters had interplaying feuds and things like that, so it kind of had some form of story. So the crowd flip out at the short arm clothesline before <laughs> Jake gets the DDT in the three on Danny Davis. Did you hear how? Did you hear the fans chanting for DDT? Yeah, Dave. What? Holy crap! Because uh, he did the move at Mania Three. No one knew what it yeah. was. No one cared. Six months later, it's one of the most over moves in the whole of the business. What a guy! Like the setup move, everyone flipped out to. Yeah, yes, like, yeah. amazing, amazing. Monsoon drops another Pearl Harbor job reference, which. Uh, Venture admonishes. You know, the Japanese, they can be a little sneaky sometimes. <laughs> Pearl Harbor was a little sneaky. Um, Hercules comes in and does his stomp with your left foot, but end up kneeing with your right knee. Did you see it? He like, if, if, he, if he jumped up, and you'd imagine some, if someone was going to stomp with their left foot, imagine that. You know, they kind of jump when they stomp. Right. But instead of stomping with your left leg, he kneed with the right knee. <laughs> It's he flinched on the left on the left. Oh, holy stomp. shit! No, I didn't. All right, you'll, you'll see it in the room. I'll put it in the room. Anyway, it's really awkward. Uh, what the fuck? And then and then we get a few Randy Orton headlocks. Ventura was great in this match. He got everything over so well. Like, t- except for one thing, he kept on bringing up with with Honky that he's that he's not that good, but he's very lucky, and that kind of pissed me off because oh, I thought I think Honky's awesome. Like. The crowd are still flipping out. Macho gets a tag and elbows Hercules four to three. So it's the faces are three on one. Hongi's the only one left standing on the heel side. So yeah, it's a rare instance of holding opponents and you do the move off the top and it succeeds. Where Macho gets a double axe handle off the top. I thought it looked really awful. It looked like he didn't jump off the ropes. He just kind of walked off the ropes or something. I think that's his thing uh, for oh, double axe handles. He kind of walks off. Okay. Oh, well, then that makes perfect sense. I think it's only the elbow goes. where he jumps. You know? Right. Well, his elbow's awesome, by the way. I thought Steamboat outworked Savage in this match. I thought he he was the MVP of the match. I thought he he's so quick. He's so smooth. He's so, I, I know I've banged on about this at Mania 2 and 3, but he's the ultimate baby face. I just think he's so awesome. Like I was just so shocked at how over Jake Roberts had gotten in six mm. months. Mm. Fantastic work. Uh, well, you can thank Alice Cooper for that. I think. <laughs> uh, Hunky makes his lips. <laughs> uh, Hunky makes a smart choice and gets huge heat. Uh, gets out of town. He doesn't want to face the faces three on one. So Savage doesn't truly get his hands on Hunky. Crowd flip out about it. And what made it better was Jesse Ventura. He he got this over and making sense with it. He said that Hunky was champion and he didn't want to get injured. So yeah. So this was the smart thing to do. Uh, while still getting it over as a healer thing to do. Great, great spot. Looking at who's left there, incredibly strong <coughs> mid-card division. Hunky's the champion with Savage, Steamer and Jake nipping at his heels. Like, that. that's awesome. Yeah. Danny Davis, the wrestling referee gimmick, had run its course by now. He'd just go down the pecking order more and more until 1989, where he just returned to being a ref. Oh, okay. He didn't have much heat. He probably had the least heat out of the whole match. At the very least, like, Ron Bass is a big guy, like. Alright, so match number two is the Women's Survivor Series match. Velvet McIntyre's team with Rockin' Robin, Moolah, the Jumping Bomb Angels uh, versus Sherry's team with Don Marie, no not that one, <laughs> Donna Christianello and the Glamour Girls, Leilani Kai and Judy Martin. Wasn't the Glamour Girls a bad comedy from the 80s with three gruesome <laughs> grannies? Like? During the Golden Girls. The Golden Girls! Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, these were them. Just not as old. Not as old. <laughs> They're not as young. Like. <laughs> um, yeah, cut to the WWF Women's Tag Team Champions. Led to the ring by Jimmy Hart, a new black and gold attire. So with Judy Martin and Leilani Kai, who looks much worse than she did at WrestleMania 1. That was Leilani That was your one. Oh, that was Leilani She aged like 10 years yeah. in four. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The John Cena treatment. When I saw the colour scheme, uh, which was black and gold, I was hoping there were some kind of female killer bees. <laughs> The Queen Bee. Yeah! <laughs> I've heard so many good things about the Jumping Bomb Angels. I was really looking forward to seeing this match. 
Oh, dear. great. That's great. Yeah, uh, they wrestled for uh, All Japan Women's back in the late, I think like the late 70s up to the late 80s. And uh, they're like regarded as two of the five greatest women workers of all time kind of thing. Cool, cool. I know Matt Stryker, when he was on commentary, he'd uh, drop their name in. <laughs> That's right, yeah. yeah. So the Queen Bees and Don Marie and the Wicked Witch of the South, Donna Christianello. Holy shit, how old are you, madam? <sighs> how shit are you as well? So sensational Sherry, yeah, when uh, she was women's champion, when did that happen? There was no women's match at WrestleMania 3, so we haven't heard from the ladies' division since WrestleMania 2, 18 months prior. Yeah, that's right, and uh, Velvet McIntyre, the young Cork lady, has somehow managed to change where she was born in the 18 months. <laughs> she was uh, she was announced as being from Dublin. She is from Dublin, and she moved to Vancouver, British Columbia, so like, she, I think she's in the Canadian Wrestling Hall of Fame. So Really? She's not a bad wrestler. I'd say she's not a good wrestler. Really? Like, I... She, I think... Oh, well, bear in mind that she's doing spots with fucking the Golden Girls. <laughs> like, I didn't know who was heel and who was facing this match. They never said it. Because I think Moolah has always been a heel. That she came across as being face in this match. Ah, ah, yes. I was trying to work this out during the match because they didn't say it. But the Jumping Bomb Angels, they're face. But they're also foreigners. Ah, shit. You see what I mean? <laughs> I, you know, I I took it for granted that Moolah's team was the face, but it's like, t- three of these could easily have been heels. Yeah. Sensational Sherry there. Uh, she was a heel who came in from the AWA, recommended by Jesse Ventura. Oh. Uh, she won the ladies title on her first night on the job in July, much like Christian, uh, beating the fabulous Moolah who turned face afterwards. So this is a short-lived face run. Oh. Yeah. Rockin' Robin, did you like her grey dinner jacket? I liked her rockin' ass, like, <laughs> she had a nice bottom. Well, you might have to fight with her for her hand from her brother, who was also on this cart. Any ideas? I'm gonna go with Jim Powers. That's wrong. Okay. <laughs> uh, rockin' Robin was Jake Roberts' sister. Yeah. Holy shit! Yeah, and by far the greenest, worst woman's wrestler. No, Donna Christianello. No <laughs> Ten times worse. They got her out in like 30 seconds. Like, See, so she could only watch two movies. <laughs> exactly, yeah, that's my whole point. <laughs> the glamour girls, Leilani Kai and Judy Martin, had been women's tag champions since August 85, but this is the first time we're seeing them compete. Uh, the belts were only around for six years, from 83 to 89, were originally on Velvet McIntyre and Princess Victoria. Uh, when the WWF succeeded uh, from the NWA. So they were the NWA tag champions and they were in the WWF and uh, WWF succeeded from them and so whoop, we're keeping these belts. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Um, waste, waste. Of, waste of time. Waste yeah. of time. Sensational Sherry and Dr- Velvet McIntyre. I was like just getting horrific nightmares of Velvet Sky's body and Drew McIntyre's face. Like. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> this is the smoothest women's match we've reviewed. McIntyre gets up on Christianello's shoulder and does the victory roll um, and gets the three. Lovely victory mm, roll. Yeah, this, um, this was well done. Yeah, uh, I I just kind of uh, said said that uh, Sherry and Velvet uh, kicked off this match. Not bad at all. Co- couple of nice spots. Then Mula happens. <laughs> Did you like her uh, one-legged wheelbarrow? Like, her Did monkey you? flip. <laughs> oh, that's my... <laughs> She's so awful. She is... Is she the worst women's wrestler ever? I think, like... But, like, she's widely regarded as the greatest because of her title well, she's writer. certainly the oldest, like... I don't know if she was wrestling great matches before film was invented, so... <laughs> you know. Whatever I've seen of her, she's been god-awful. I thought, yeah, Rock and Robin, just extremely green. I thought she, like, she was landing wrong and being awkward just in she, her moves and uh, selling. Rock and Robin? Yeah. She can't run the ropes. Did you notice that every time she turned to run the ropes, she'd turn and hit it side on? Like ribs first, and so uh, kind of tagging it. Like yeah, botched a cross body twice. Yeah, on the second cross body, she pins Don Marie. So thank God she's out. Yeah. So Mula's face team are five three up. Yeah, you get some really nice spots by Izuki of the Jumping Bomb Angels, which the commentators really put over here. I thought she was one of the best workers on the whole card. I thought she was absolutely amazing. She's pulling off these spots that look great with some of the worst workers <laughs> in. The, the business like I, I, I've got to give her props for it um, I thought she stole this show she she hit a beautiful uh, top rope arm drag and and a lovely double underhook uh, suplex as well I was like just my jaw was hitting the ground watching this match she was awesome 
I got the feeling that when she was wrestling, the other wrestlers weren't sure what to do. Like, she had no mind, I'm going to do this move, and they couldn't keep up with her or something, you know? Yeah, I, I, I got that feeling. well agree with that. Uh, Japanese wrestlers, they learn wrestling through English. Right? That's correct, yeah, yeah. and uh, Japanese fighters as well, and referees. Because it seems like she had to slow down to call spots with them, you know? It, it just I got that whenever she's gone to the ropes, she's kind of rolling her eyes a little, or that kind of thing, you know? That's right, because in Japanese, if... if they're having a match and the two wrestlers are Japanese and the ref is Japanese, he'll still call the spots and match in English, mm, mm. which is very strange. Mm. But uh, very helpful if you want very to Very helpful, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, we get an awful monkey flip from Rock and Robin. Jerry suplexes Robin and gets the three. McIntyre does an impressive tilt-a-world crossbody, which is weird if you think about it. It felt like a botch, but they, but she kind of reined it in the end and pulled it off, so... Uh, Every time Velvet was in the match, she um, she impressed me. Thought she was a pretty good worker, though. One of the things I noticed is that the women, all of these women, do missile drop kicks. So they kick flat, you know, horizontally at you instead of on your side. On your side? Yeah, like normal male <laughs> male drop kicks. Like, hmm. just just if you have a look, there. Oh, there's just like an anatomical reason for that, like you know the way the hips are shaped or something. I just think it's easier to bump. Like, easier to land with a missile drop kick. Because uh, David hits all his drop kicks the same. He hits the missile back drop. Maybe it's a Japanese thing. But yeah. all, all of the women seem to be doing missile drop kicks. Yeah, first. maybe. Uh, Mula was eliminated by Judy after a double clothesline. One one, got, one girl being on the outside, girl being a euphemism. <laughs> Judy the Terminator Martin, <laughs> who sold for no one. Did you notice that? <laughs> oh, she battered like five people at one time. <laughs> you wonder, can she sell? Boston Crab by Velvet McIntyre, uh, released by accident, so she turns it into a sit-down, hold-legs manoeuvre, which I gave out stink about. But to her credit, she turns it around into a bow and arrow. McIntyre sandbags Sherry in a dangerous-looking gut-round suplex. I totally blame Sherry on this. You think so? Yeah. She nearly killed her. She you... landed on her neck, and she was in pain for the rest of the match, like... She was doing a gut round suplex, jump you, like. You think she sandbagged him? You t- probably just a mistiming, maybe. Maybe do you think Sherry might not have been strong enough to? Do it? Yeah, you know, like maybe she tried to actually wrench her up for a suplex, as opposed I, to going up for it, maybe. Because she dropped her on her head, like. I'm just wary of Velvet. I don't trust her. I think she's just not a great worker. So either it was a mistiming, or she didn't. She thought I'm helping you out by sandbagging you. <laughs> Here, here you go. Like, here's my body, you know. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I, I blame her on that. Yeah, I, I, because from from watching this match, <laughs> I just thought that uh, Velvet was a good worker. So, um, so we'll blame the woman on that one. Uh, um, something that I feel is endemic to women's wrestling these days is that I just noticed with Velvet McIntyre is that she's doing a lot of more complex moves and sequences, and she's a little out of her depth. So that would make her botch because she can't pull them off perfectly. So more the fans would give out that she's botching. Mm. So she'd try more complex stuff to show that she's better and she'd botch them and it's a continual cycle. If I was booking this match and I knew about the, the you know the workers, I'd have made sure to have Velvet on the opposite side to the jumping bomb angels. Yeah. Because yeah. you know that probably would have made this match an awful lot better. Like. Mm. Uh, I noticed with her uh, her drop kicks actually she'd kick uh, when she's like tummy up and then she'd land on her tummy. So she'd actually do a kind of flip when she kicks, so it looks really Ooh, weird. Uh, Paul London does that. Hmm. Yeah. Velvet McNair here, she's uh, she's completely legless. No, she's barefoot. That's, yeah, that's, that's right. And that's actually a gimmick that she had. Uh, one time when she was wrestling, somebody stole her boots, and so she had to go out barefoot. And uh, she kind of thought, hmm, that's, that's a bit of a gimmick. Yeah, that's yeah. Good. So, like, uh, like the old cork kind of muck savages, like, you know? <laughs> We got a giant swing by McIntyre, which is great. So straight out of the eighties, uh, gets on the shoulders again. Another roll through uh, with the victory roll and pin Sherry. So we're down to three faces versus two heels. Oh, we got a hot body scissor. Oh, that's right. Uh, scissor me timbers, like that was hot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I did appreciate that. Yeah, there was a great spot where McIntyre tries the victory roll for a third time, but instead gets a hot shot and electric chair instead and is eliminated by Leilani Kai. Yeah, uh, I thought that spot was great. Yeah. Uh, I thought it looked very well. 
And uh, just, I thought that the Glamour Girls were booked like the road warriors in this match. <laughs> they just ran through everyone. It was so funny. Two of the worst workers in the matches. Yeah, like. yeah. two of the oldest workers in, in, in the ring. Two on two. So we got the Jumping Bomb Angels versus the Glamour Girls. <laughs> Frenchie attire clad Jumping Bomb Angel gets to the top rope. And there's a crossbody on Kai for the three. Uh, the pop of the match was when the Frenchie Jumping Bomb Angel clocks the mouth. And the other one hits a top rope clothesline for the three and the win. So the number one contenders pin the women's tag champions. So yeah, that makes makes ton of sense. Yeah, yeah it makes absolutely perfect sense. I th- I thought this match was great. Uh, I'll put my hands up and say there were a lot of botched spots. That that's fair enough. But I thought that the good far outweighed the bad. And I've no doubt that if you put ten of the best workers in women's wrestling today. The match would be nowhere near as good as this. Yeah, yeah, I'll, um, I'll give you that. I, I was pleased. I was very, very pleased. I said this match went uh, just over twenty minutes. Really? Yeah, yeah. I was. It wasn't until kind of the last five minutes that it kind of dragged for me. You know, if this match was fifty minutes, all in all, I reckon it would have been a very solid match. And if it was cut down to ten minutes, it would probably be one of the best women's matches ever. Mm, yeah. We had the Hard Foundation and their team. With Bobby Heenan cut a half decent promo, nothing special. The best part about it were Bobby Heenan again, just being such a great manager, just that Weasley character. And uh, Jimmy Hart was pretty good, but nothing special. Bret Hart was still quite bland at this point, he didn't have much character. Mm, not like he was in 97. What I noticed from the Heenan interview is that there's too many people here. There's four tag teams, and it's like these, these matches are five people. And then it was only till the, the other. The face tag team interview with Strike Force. That hope. Hang on a minute. <laughs> this this is a ten tag team match. Yeah. There are twenty people and ten tag teams. All of them with names and specific ah! gimmicks and specific color schemes. It was like holy shit. If there's one thing this pay per view proved, it was in the eighties. WWF had a fucking awesome tag team division and an even better mid card division. Because that first match with its 10 mid characters, awesome. Also, before the next match, uh, did you have uh, Nikolai Volkov sing the national anthem? I think they went straight into it. Okay, well, basically, he was singing the national anthem, and the rest of his team came out to him singing the Russian that national anthem. That sounds great. It was, it was pretty cool. Okay, match number three is the 10 tag team Survivor Series match. Uh, so we get Strike Force with the Bulldogs, the Young Stallions, the Killer Bees. And the Rougeau brothers versus the Hart Foundation with Demolition, the Islanders, the Bolsheviks, and the new Dream Team. The Bolsheviks? Yeah, yeah, they're the Russian. Oh, the tag Volkov team. and Zukov. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, There's a bit of reshuffling at the time, so I'll give you a bit of background. Okay. Uh, the Canam connection, they split during the summer. Oh, oh Zink. <laughs> Zink and Martel, yeah. Uh, Zink left, but Martel stayed and joined up with Tito. Uh, who beat the Hart Foundation for the straps a month prior to the Survivor Series. <clears throat> uh, this was the pay-per-view debut of the Young Stallions, a bland babyface tag team. However, later on, Roma would keep the power, but he dropped Jim Powers down the line. <laughs> Volkov and Zukov, where's the Sheik, you say? Uh, well, this is amazing. First of two amazing anecdotes in this pay-per-view. Well, in May 1987, Kayfabe's in full effect. This is 10 years off dirt sheets. Jim Duggan and the Iron Sheik were pulled over by the cops when they were driving down the road because Duggan had marijuana and Sheik looked coked out of it. Duggan was given a conditional discharge and Sheik a one-year probation. The scandal broke afterwards that two supposed hated rivals were partying together. And Vince didn't like that at all. So both were given the boot for the time being. Although Duggan would be right back for this uh, Survivor Series pay-per-view. This is his first big show back. And Sheik was still out. Uh, he had a short stint back in the WWF in 88, but we wouldn't see him on pay-per-view. And he'll resurface again in 1991, and when he does, he'll be the pro-Iraq Colonel Mustafa. Nice. Yeah. King Tonga, also known as Haku, he teamed with the former Tonga Kid, aka Toma, to form the Islanders. The island of Tonga, probably. Uh, first pay-per-view appearances of Demolition as well, although they wouldn't be using one of their renowned cheating staples in this match, that would be someone else. Demolition, actually, was originally Bill Eady and Randy Cully as Axe and Smash, managed by Johnny Valiant. But the WWF replaced Cully with Barry Darso, who later became the Repo Man, mm-hmm. and Valiant with Mr. Fuji. So there's a huge shuffle there. 
Question of her is, why were they called the Killer Bees? <laughs> in American football, the Miami Dolphins defense unit was known as the Killer Bees, and they were dominant in the NFL at the time, many of whom last names started with B. Bomb, Bob, Bomb, Bob, Bomb. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> uh, yeah. Your man. <laughs> Bill Barnett, Lyle Blackwood, Glenn Blackwood, Charles Bowser, Doug. I'm editing this out. Bob Brodinski. <laughs> Bob Bomb. Bow. <laughs> What? Is you pronounce Baumhauer? Baumhauer. Bob Baumhauer. Bob Baumhauer. Bob Baumhauer. Anyway, lots of <laughs> a lot of bees. Like <laughs> so, they were the killer bees, and so this is a play on American football. Would you say that they've got like a hive mind? Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh god. Um, I have to say, um, more importantly, this this, this is a very a important. lot of honeys. Like. <laughs> How long do we have left to make bee puns? <laughs> I'm so sorry, listeners. I can't help it. Their last match is in August 88. Would you say they want to be the champions? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm done. Like, I'm like, done. All right. Like, the last time we get to see them is at WrestleMania 4. So you got to make these. Oh, okay. Like. <laughs> I thought you were going to get like 12 puns out of like bee. Like... <laughs> Alright, so we find out when Tito pins Zukov after flying forearm that when someone gets eliminated, their tag partner is also eliminated. That was a great idea. Yep. It was like he was uh, rushing to get out. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that, that's the stuff. Did you notice how over Strike Force were? They got massive pop. Fans were behind them 100%. Monson quips that the bees owed a little sting action. <laughs> I thought the match was just a simmering clusterfuck. It was like, if anything taught me about wrestling, it's like, when are they all just going to get in the ring and ten of them get eliminated? I'd imagine if OOC was here, he'd punch me in the face for saying this. This was clearly the worst match on this show. It was such a clusterfuck. There was 20 people, and there were so many people on the ring apron that they had to keep on changing the camera because once the action went to the bottom right of the ring, you couldn't see because there was 10 men blocking it. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, just like a good 15 minutes of this match, you couldn't even see it. I also thought that this match, it was the longest of the matches as well. It went over 30 minutes. Whoa. So there couldn't be any story because there's too many of you. Yeah, that's it, my yeah. major problem. There was like, A, you, you, you couldn't see it because there were so many men. B, <laughs> uh, it was just like move, tag, move, tag, move, tag. There was no story. There was no... Anything. Yeah. <laughs> I just it was such a blur I just couldn't keep track of anything really. The new dream team, Valentine and Dino Bravo. Dino Bravo, yeah. Has there ever been a successful the new moniker? Even the new generation of WWF, the worst period in history. Yeah. The new rockers, Lee Cassidy and Mary Gennetti. The new Blackjacks, Bradshaw and uh Fahed Wyndham. No. The new Midnight Express. Uh, that, that's... Bombastic Bob and Bodacious Bart. <laughs> Bodacious Bart. Yeah, you're uh, probably not. Oh, I have it. Go on, go the on. The new Heart Foundation, of course. <laughs> mm. Those those talkers and lookers. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> my God. So, yeah, if it's such anything, do not put anyone as the new. It's Like, if they were shit, you shouldn't be naming yourself after a shit tag team. And if they're good... You're not going to live up to them. You yeah. Know? If you're that good, you'd have your own gimmick. Like. Uh, Axe pins Jacques after he misses a second rope crossbody. Jim Powers was a roid monkey. He was ripped. Holy shit. Like. Smash intentionally shoes the ref away with an elbow and Demolition get eliminated. The only tag team to be eliminated without jobbing. So they're being groomed, brother. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's because these guys got the uh, Legion of Doom push. Like. Mm. Did you know when they first came out, they were actually written off as a wannabe road warriors? I can absolutely understand why. They were awesome, though. Yeah, yeah. I remember being a kid thinking these guys were fucking badasses. Like. I, I never twigged the two together. Like No. You know, made like I didn't think their gimmicks were similar. Because like, well, they were S&M shirts. I was, shirt, I was shirt, also but. four. Like. Yeah. <laughs> Hart hits a beautiful pile driver to dynamite. At some point, I noticed that the Bulldogs were never eliminated, but they were gone. That's because the Coliseum home video released edited it out. 
What? Why was that? They well, I guess they were they one of no, actually the Wild Stallions. <laughs> <laughs> They're the least uh, impressive tag team. I can only imagine that it's for time, but because like the Bulldogs were in this match for like twenty minutes before they were uh, pinned. Neither of them were in the match. Like a uh, Bulldog did nothing for like twenty minutes and then came in, did a spot or two, and he got super kicked and got pinned. Like. Because the spot was Dynamite went for his diving headbutt off the top rope on the Islanders and he hit it, but he should have known better than the headbutt of Foreigner because it hurt his own head and he got pinned. Although Dynamite has a pretty hard head. Yeah, for a that was his fucking like, gimmick. Like, yeah. Well, you know, he's foreign as well. Like, He's just <laughs> not as foreign as the lads from Tonga. Like. So, yeah. Um, and wasn't that the same... Sp- the same spot that they had at WrestleMania 3. Yeah, Bulldog threw Valentine into Dynamite's head. Yes. And got the pin out. Yeah, of yeah. Dynamite, his back is held together by tape. He is on the way out. He can't move. Neither of the lads did anything in this match. They mm. were protected until, of course, the spot where they went down where they looked like idiots. Fan heat for the match died when Drake Force got uh, pinned. Fans just stopped caring about this. Oh, match. was that it? Was yeah. on it? At some point, I thought the match last year, but I thought that was just me. Like, they're the tag champions, so yeah, yeah who cares now? Um, you know, Toma, they have a discussion on if it's Toma or Tuma or Tuma. Or, <laughs> it's not a Tuma. <laughs> Hitman saves Anvil after a flying forearm with an elbow to the back of Tito's head and neck, and Anvil gets the three. So the tag champs get pinned by the number one contenders. Uh, Ventura makes reference of his pilgrim hat, saying it's from Ephraim the Body, his great-great-grandfather. I thought that joke died a sorry death. Yeah, that wasn't great. Anvil gives Powers a hot shot, which Monsoon calls a clothesline city. I don't mind if it's a clothesline and he calls it clothesline city. It's like, I don't know, Nastyville or Dudleyville or something. But oh, okay. It was a hot shot, so there was no clothesline. While Valentine starts to apply a figure four, Roma gets the sunset flip off the top and the three. Lovely spot, and thank God Valentine went out. He was the worst worker in the match by a mile. Like, yeah, this is great. Made Paul Roma look pretty fucking cool. So it's down to the Hearts and the Islanders versus the Killer Bees and the Wild Stallions. Jumpin' Jim reverses a pin after being drop kicked by Haku for the three, and then we get an Ionian nerve grip to slow things down by Tama. Uh, the Islanders are barefoot, as was McIntyre. So I was thinking only savages and muck savages are uh, barefoot. <laughs> and yeah, with jumping Jim Brunzel, he didn't do much jumping. He was a he, more of a mat wrestler. Yeah, uh, he spent like pretty much all the time he was in the match in a real chin chin lock. Like mm, mm. Uh, he was also an ugly man. <laughs> His face bugged me. Like. V like was it? Yeah, I was gonna say buzz off like. <laughs> The Islander Toma says, Let's go, baby! <laughs> In the middle of... <laughs> It's not very savage. No. I'm, I'm fairly sure Umaga never shouted that. Yeah. Bret Hart went for a drop kick on Jumping Jim and missed it. And somehow, from the same bump he would have taken if he had hit it, he got pinned. <laughs> so he missed a jump kick and got pinned. And then, for like the next five or ten minutes, the match completely slows down. Booking nonsense. It was like they booked the Islanders, the heel, to be two against four. But yeah, they're still controlling the match. It made, made no sense to me in either way. Like, mm. So the finish of the match, the Killer Bee with a mask on, they must have put them on for the finish to do the Demolition switcheroo. Because this is Demolition's gimmick, but uh, Killer Bee stole it. I don't have a pun for that, that- Switcheroo and get the win and say, uh, see ya, wouldn't want to be it to the <laughs> Islanders. <laughs> Leaving this, Demolition were kept strong and the Heart Foundation were the main heels, but that wouldn't last long. Pretty much the end of the line for the new Dream Team, which would break up and the two would have Peter and Ed singles runs. Again, just got to mention the incredible depth of the division. None of these uh, were two singles slapdash together. Ten teams with team names, specific looks and gimmicks, and colour schemes. Yeah. yeah, fuck you WWE um, and fuck you TNA. <laughs> Just to get that in. There was an amazing montage of Million Dollar Man promos. Is Ted DiBiase thankful for anything on this holiday? Well, I like the money, of course. But what I really like is what the money can make people do for me. Now I'm a generous man. And I've given many people, many an opportunity to make some of my money. For doing the most ordinary of things. 
<laughs> to my satisfaction. <laughs> if you can dribble this basketball 15 times consecutively without missing, look at here, I'm going to give you $500. Now, I know you and your family could use $500. I could tell by looking at you that you could use a lot more than 500 bucks. Okay. Virgil, give me the basketball. Okay, Sean, 15 times. Ready, go. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Oops! Ah! Oh. We didn't get to 15, Sean. You didn't get to 15, did you? No. He didn't make 15. And you know what that means? What that means, John, is you've got to learn a hard, cruel fact of life. When you don't do the job right, you don't get paid. <laughs> what would it take to make this a private pool right now? I'm afraid I can't do that. It's a public pool and our taxpayers, and I'd have a lot of problems with the mothers and fathers. Listen, mister, I pay more taxes in a month than these people make in a year. Virgil? I think there's a little too much chlorine in the water, don't you? I'll be right back. Yeah. Get these brats out of the water. All right, everybody out. The chlorine level's too high. We're going to close the pool. Let's go. Come on. Come on, you brats. Get out the pool. All of you. Come on out. Out, out. Come on. Let's go. <laughs> Thanksgiving. I bet those kids were thankful. Thankful that I didn't decide to keep the pool for the whole summer. Everybody's got a price for the Million Dollar Man, even on Thanksgiving. <laughs> Boy, that was disgusting. Jess. I kind of enjoyed it myself, yeah, I, Gorilla. I, I figured you would enjoy what that. happened to a son, man? Talent is not genetic, is it? Yes. Ask David Flair, like. <laughs> That's true. Uh, yeah, he's got no charisma. If he could do a version that was half as good, he'd be a superstar in 2011. Mm -hmm. Like, his father was so talented. It's a sin that he wasn't champion. It's he yeah, yeah. Awesome. so many people deserved yeah. much more, but that's that's how it was. <laughs> in, was that's how it was in the eighties because Vince had taken the best of every territory where they were money money making draws, and every kind of world champion in a different area. That's your mid card. Yeah, holy, holy shit, shit, that's your roster. All right, let's get back to it. No, we can't because <laughs> before we go to the main event, there was another promo. Honky Tonk Man comes out. I don't think this has been the case with you. This is not a night you will want to remember. What just what do you mean by that? It's not the night I want to remember. I am the survivor. The whole world saw it. Three on one. The honky tonk man was not defeated. The greatest intercontinental champion of all time. And I'll say this. You line them up and I will knock them down one by one. I will accept a challenge from anybody. And that means you, Hulk Hogan. I know, I know deep down you're jealous of me. You've always been jealous of the Honky Kong Man. And I'll take the Intercontinental Heavyweight Championship and I'll put it against that belt of yours anytime. And for you, Macho Man Randy Savage, you're nothing. You are nothing. I don't want to ever see you again because you can't beat me. Nobody can beat me. I'm the greatest Intercontinental Heavyweight Champion of all time. So you line them up and let the Honky Tonk Man knock them down. The total entertainment package. I sing, I dance, and I play the guitar. Woo! Awesome promo. Honky was awesome. Don't let anyone tell you anything different. <laughs> Steve. <laughs> <laughs> he was great. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Um, I think it's Niall that hates hockey. Oh, is it? <laughs> yeah. Niall. Niall. <laughs> Sorry, Steve. Um, all right, it's time for your main event. <laughs> As I was just thinking of, you know, Alberto Del Rio, whenever he says his name, he's just so happy. <gasps> he fist pumps after yes. saying his own name. He's like, so he, great. He loves being Alberto Del yeah. Rio, you know? Survivor! You got it! You got it! You got it! You got it! 
It's time for your main event. This is Hulk Hogan's team versus Andre's team. So Andre, who's with King Kong Bundy. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> One man gang. Uh, Rick Rude and Butch Reed versus Hulk Hogan, Ken Patera, Don The Rock Morocco, Bam Bam Bigelow and Paul Orndorff. insurance policy you live you die you survive but i tell you what i've done everything i could to cover my back man oh you got these look at them man look how hungry they are the natural food chain here doesn't matter man the larger animals like andre the giant it doesn't matter when they're this hungry an animal like ken Matera or mr wonderful could eat him alive first thing i thought of is that all right hulk hogan hulk hogan many air what are the odds that hogan will be the last guy standing for his team and win I was about 100% certain that was going to happen. And my second thought is, holy shit, there's only four matches on the card. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I heard that at the opening of the show, and I was like, this is going to be a really short show. But then I remembered, like, oh, hold on, it's nearly three hours long. But yeah, uh, shocked with only four matches. Two, two things I want to mention. Okay, Ken Patera. He won the silver in the World Weightlifting Championships in 1971, gold in the Pan American Games, and came third in the 77 World Strongest Man competition. And Mark Henry... Did he actually in 77? He did, yeah. That's yeah. pretty yeah, fucking impressive. That is very impressive. Ugh. Mark Henry got a silver in the 95 Pan American Games, so Ken Patera got a gold in 71. But he did win the 2002 Arnold Strongman Classic, which is... You know, it's kind of nice, but it's not an official Olympic kind of uh, invitational. In terms of Olympic, no, but uh, he does also hold the world record for lifting up the world's largest dumbbell, single yeah. bicep curl. Yeah. Have, have you seen it? Like, No. The, the actual bar that you grab hold, it's as thick as, you know, the pole on a bus stop. Holy it's, shit. Yeah. It's like 220 pounds or something in one hand. It's pretty impressive. Like. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So, Mark Henry, not the world's most strongest man. There's someone on the roster who's legitimately higher up in the world's strongest man competition. Ted RCD. <laughs> <laughs> All right, hold on. This is an amazing story about Ken Patera because you notice when he comes to the ring, uh, Ventura chastises us and calls him a jailbird. Yes! What was that? <laughs> all right, all right, here we go. On April 6th, 1984, WWF, uh, Mr. Saito and Ken Patera were refused service at a McDonald's restaurant after a restaurant had closed. The two men threw a wobbly and threw a boulder through the restaurant's window in retaliation. Uh, Patera said it was an ex-employee, not him. Uh, when the police came, they battered the police. <laughs> They got arrested. So in late 85, Sato and Patera were convicted of battery of a police officer and sentenced to serve two years in prison. Holy shit. Um... <laughs> yeah, uh, Jesse says that he can't believe these people are cheering on a jailbird. <laughs> and uh, I, I have about a billion question marks next to the statement. Uh, thanks very much for that. That's an amazing story. Um... So now in late 1987, Patera is fresh out of prison and back in the WWF. So, because there were no, well, there was a dirt sheet, but like what percentage of fans in 87 were reading the dirt sheet? So there was no need to really mention it because you're just raising, up, you know, more negative Yeah, press, yeah, you know? it makes, no, either Vince told him to say this or Vince threw a wobbly after he said it. I reckon know? Vince hates Ventura, so I reckon it was a shoot comment. Yeah, I reckon right, he's yeah, always like Probably that. then, probably. Which makes him such a great commentator. Heenan cuts uh, like a quick promo on the fans calling them worms and, I don't, didn't get and everything. Uh, he just uh, introduces Andre and rags in the fans. He, he was great again. Like Hogan cuts a promo with his team. Did you get that? With his eye patch with <laughs> added tassels. <laughs> He looked amazing. I pissed myself laughing when I saw him. Why is Butch Reed wearing Hulk Hogan's attire? He was... Was he? Was he wearing yellow? Yellow, 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 yellow. yeah. Mm. Anyway, so he was first out via the immortal leg drop. Thank God. And that's what you get, mate. Did you notice how quickly this match got off? I, I expected this to be really slow and plodding, and Andre's team was four massive men, and I just thought they were going to get in the corner and... You know, punch, punch, kick, kick. But uh, no, this match got off to a really good start. Even Hogan, you know, was wrestling like he meant it. Like, 
the crowd were going ballistic. Everyone's mad over it. Yeah. I can't emphasize that enough how loud everyone was for everything. It's just everyone's going mental. It's so awesome to see people this happy about wrestling, you know? Faces battered Rick Rude for ages, and then Butch Reed tagged in. Then Hogan pinned Reed. He was celebrating with his team that he'd gotten the early pin, and he gave Ken Patera a high five to celebrate. And he gave this high five just as Andre was getting in the ring to sneak attack Hogan from behind. But the ref mistook the high five as a tag. The fans saw Hogan tagged out and were booing him. He didn't want to come across as a pussy. All right, so this Ken Patera, he's faced now because he confronted Heenan about abandoning him when he was in prison. And he'll feud with the Heenan family members to no fanfare. One man guy, he's from Bill Watts UWF. Rick Rude came in from the AWA. And he came out to porno music as Sade's smooth operator. That's awesome. It was amazing. Uh, I was watching this and my auntie was in my house and she came in and she kind of stopped and went, is that Rick Rude? And I said, yeah, yeah. She spent five minutes telling me about her, about how she fancied the arse off him back in the (laughs) 80s. I thought that was an awesome story. Everyone was a wrestling fan like that. Yeah. Yeah, That's that's awesome. I was like, you know, my auntie who's nearly 60. Yeah. It was so so awesome. Imagine if they had the market penetration they do now back in the 80s. Yeah, it'd be very impressive, wouldn't it? All right, last but not least, we have Bam Bam Bigelow, who's inexplicably a baby face here. Yeah, like, looks like Mexico man. Uh, he came from Jerry Jarrett and Jerry Lawler's Continental Wrestling Association. His debut angle was that many managers were vying to sign him. They were whittled down to slick until Sir Oliver Humperdinck was revealed as Bam Bam's new manager. And uh, there you go. And he's a face. Sir Oliver Humperdinck. Uh, his stupid name was to draw heat from the Quebec crowd because it was apparently a very English name and the English, the French hate the English. What about next week when you're not in Quebec? I, well, he was in... No, no, it's like... He, he was based in yeah, Quebec. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah, that's fine. And last but not least, we got Don The Rock Morocco, which is so weird hearing people call someone yeah. else The Rock. He's subbing for superstar Billy Graham, who couldn't return due to problems after having hip surgery. So this was supposed to be his big return, but he couldn't. I have the words, Jesus Christ, he's fucking huge. Holy... Yeah, like, yeah. Because uh, I, I made a note at WrestleMania 3 that... In the year between two and three, he was just as bulky as ever, but he wasn't as ripped because he was getting older. And then six months later, holy shit, he was bursting out of his skin. He looked like he was ready to have a coronary. Yeah, yeah. So he was saying, no, 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 no. Like, I'll gladly fight Andre now. I didn't tag out. I was just giving the high five. But the ref overruled it. But it's like, he, he easily could have tagged back in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? That, that, a brilliant spot, but makes no sense. Yeah. Just tag the fuck back in. Yeah. You don't even need to tag in, because they haven't locked up, so you can legally actually just get out, and he'll come back in, as Monsoon told us in WrestleMania 1. Oh. So, uh, ah, wrestling rules, mate. Like. Wrestling rule book. <laughs> yeah. Did I ever tell you about the time where Vince actually asked someone to write up the wrestling rule book? Really? It was supposedly in, like, the late 90s. And they were booking a match. Someone came up with a spot that Vince loved. And then someone else said, yeah, but that's that's breaking the rules of wrestling. And Vince went, what do you mean breaking the rules? Where, where is the rule book? And, and someone's like, Vince, we don't have a rule book. So then he f- flipped out and made someone go home and write the rule book. And when he came back into work like a day later, Vince fucked it in the bin. like Because he'd ch- changed his mind. Fuck's sake. Yeah. I thought that would have been amazing. Yeah. <laughs> the, book on wrestling. The, the rule book. This like. is a gimmick. This <laughs> is a wrestler, serious wrestler gimmick. Someone giving out and changing the rules and, you know, paragraph six here. Look at that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Hogan just high fives in Ken Patera. Panther, uh, Panther. <laughs> uh, Patera looks like he should be hawking shamwows or something. The state of his outfit and his big bushy triangle hair, like uh, uh, he looked like something out of the seventies. Yeah, and yeah. this was late eighties, like yeah. on some kind of shopping network. Patera whips, oh my god, into the ropes for a clothesline, but one my guy goes for one of his own and kind of just flattens Patera with it and gets the three. Ken Patera whips uh, one man gang into the turnbuckle and he nearly breaks the fucking ring leg. Mm-hmm. Jesse and Monsoon uh, were very nervous at that point. Like. Yeah, when Hogan tags in Bam Bam, uh, the crowd go nuts about it. So this must be the biggest pop of his career. Like. Bundy hits Orndorff in the back of the head. Uh, Root schoolboys in for the three. 
Hogan gets in, has his way with Rude and tags in The Rock for a snap power slam and gets the pin. So we're down to three versus three. Bundy, Gang and Andre versus Hogan, Bam Bam and Morocco. It's so weird to hear people call Don Morocco The Rock. I just can't get over it. Yeah, it's just totally weird. Do you think it's weird for people who grew up in the 80s to hear The Rock rock? being called The Rock? Hmm. Yeah, Yeah, probably. Uh, Probably a rare bunch of people that have been watching through the two ages. Uh, The Rock fails to pick up one man gang, runs into a headbutt by Andre, and gets the world's strongest splash for the three. So we get a rare sighting of a big man stopping the sunset flip and actually crushing the opponent, you know, sitting down as uh, one man gang does the bam bam. Hogan works the crowd really well from the outside, waiting for the hot tag. Finally, at the end of it, it's just a great booking idea. We get to see Andre in. And almost immediately, we get the hot tag to Hogan, and the crowd goes to the man. Yeah. Looks small next to this guy. He ducked underneath and makes a tag. Here it comes. Here we go. Here we go. It's Andre and the Hulkster face to face, toe to toe. He tried for the headbutt, but the champ blocked it. Big chop. Champ answers with another chop. Andre went like 20 minutes without even getting in the match. Mm. He must have been beyond gone at this point. Mm. Like, How much longer did Andre have in his career in WWE? He's still good for another mania. Like, anyway. Right, okay. I don't know. I'm trying not to... I'm avoiding spoilers. Like. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> You've heard your spoilers. Hogan and Andre go back and forth until Bundy pulls out Hogan and they brawl to the outside until Hogan gets counted out. The crowd hates it. But in the, oh no, mark out positive kind of way, like it's still a positive vibe, but they're just really into it. And I thought this was excellent use of Andre versus Hogan. They had it, but they're still saving it, denying you of the real payoff. Yeah. So it's Bam Bam by himself versus Andre, Bundy and One Man Gang. So it's the opposite way around from the first match on the card. I have to say, Hogan, he stayed in the ring for ages. It pissed me off. He he took all the heat for himself. Like, it goes beyond telling the crowd what's going on and being a cunt and taking yeah. all the heat for yourself. Yeah. Like. And so, this is the first time it happened, so I wasn't that mad at this point in the game, you know? Bam Bam does a slingshot splash over the top rope onto Bundy uh, from the outside and gets the three. It's really good. Uh, One Man Gang does the lamest top rope splash. Oh my god, he fucking bottled it. It was like a top rope landing Mm -hmm. (laughs) he landed on his feet and then flopped it looked really bad not quite as bad as Vicky Guerrero's top rope splash the hog splash (laughs) yeah (laughs) it's a great name yeah it's a good name Um, but uh, yeah he misses and Bam Bam gets the pin and it's down to two Bam Bam was so over by this point this one match did so much to get him over with the fans it's like it's so easy Wrestling is not difficult, like. Yeah, yeah. Um, Bam Bam uh, tries to escape from Andre oh, <laughs> with his barrel rolls. Like. <laughs> Do a barrel roll. Uh, three commando rolls, and he was gassed after the first one, completely gassed. So the second and third were hilarious. Oh, um, yeah. So Andre hits a hip toss suplex. Awful, which, botched. Yeah, looked terrible. Yeah. Uh, which, like, it's hard for Bam Bam to sell this because it was very awkward looking. And gets the three for the big win. Andre's team win in the main event of the first ever Survivor Series. And then Hogan hits the ring and cleans house. And Hogan's team hits. And And he he, steals all the heat for himself. You know, so what was the point of giving Andre the win? Andre getting the win still makes sense. Because he still kind of keeps like... He had to win this. Bam Bam who I feel bad for. Because Bam Bam put in this great, brave, babyface battle and went... You know, three against one with three of the biggest men in wrestling. And, you know, he does a pretty good job. And then Hogan comes down and steals it. Mm. They do this in different pay-per-views and house shows when they're ending it with a heel win. And heel gets the win. That's the next part of the storyline. 
the cameras stop rolling and then the face can come out and get his heat back so people in the crowd can go home happy. Yeah. You know, and I feel that's what they should have done here, but sure, this is probably the first time it's happened, so um, I learned from it. Like. I thought Heenan did an awesome job when, when Hogan ran down and robbed all the heat and he was begging Andre to get in the ring and fire him and Heenan's pushing him off and like, no, don't, don't, don't. I thought Heenan was great. Also was Jesse Ventura, who as Hogan is celebrating and doing his poses, as the show goes to black, Ventura is just berating him because he lost. <laughs> he was fucking great. Like, he's so good. Yeah. So backstage, Heenan and Andre are with Mean Gene. Heenan accepts the challenge from Hogan, but when Andre is asked how he feels about it, he just says, I'm really smart and I'm the survivor. <laughs> <laughs> he's the back of the survivor. <laughs> but just like I promise. Everybody, I wear British Ferrari, and I say, I'm just Ferrari, because it's not nice, not nice to just Ferrari. Alright, a little bit of housekeeping. So, it's November 26, 1987, from the Richmond Coliseum in Ohio. Survivor Series 1987, the attendance was 21,300. Match number one, Savage's team with Steamboat, Beefcake, Roberts and Duggan beat Honky's team with Harley Race, Danny Davis, Hercules and Rob Bass with Survivors, Savage, Steamboat and Roberts at 19 minutes 11. Match number two. Yeah. I thought that match was great. Yeah. 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 And match number two uh, was the Women's Survivor Series match with Velvet McIntyre's team with Rockin' Robin, Moolah, the Jumping Bomb Angels uh, defeated Sherry's team with Don Marie, Donna Castellaneto and the Glamour Girls. Leilani Khan and Judy Martin. Their survivors were the Jumping Bomb Angels in a match that went 2014 in Match of Night. I'd agree with that. Uh, I, th- I thoroughly enjoyed the match. Match number three is the 10 Tag Team Survivor Series match where it was the Strike Force with the Bulldogs, the Young Stallions, the Killer Bees and the Rougeos defeated the Hart Foundation's team with Demolition, the Islanders, the Bolsheviks and the New Dream team. The survivors were the Killer Bees and the Young Stallions. The match went... 30 minutes 44, fuck me. Uh, worst match of the night yeah, for, yeah. for me. Just a bit cluster. Like, uh, in terms of moves done and spots done, it, it was the best match of the night. But as an overall match, when you take in story and just being able to see the fucking moves, like, uh, yeah, it was the worst match of the night. And then we have the main event, which is Hulk's team versus Andre's team. <laughs> so Andre with Bundy, uh, One Man Gang, Rick Rude and Butch Reed. Defeated Hulk Hogan with Ken Patera, Don Morocco, Bam Bam Bigelow, and Paul Orndorff. And the sole survivor was Andre the Giant in 22 minutes 53 seconds. Only four matches. What do you think overall? Overall, I thought this pay-per-view was awesome. Uh, it's the best one I've that I've watched so far between the three manias and this. Every match was at least good. You know, the tag match had its bad points, but there was enough action to keep, keep it going. One of the best women's matches I've ever seen. The main event was very good. Great to see Hogan not win, but out of all the shows so far I've seen, this is the first time I've seen the kind of cunt Hulk Hogan. He overshadowed everybody and mainly one, two, and three. He was just so awesome and over that you couldn't really say anything bad about him, but this, he was taking away from Bam Bam and Andre mm. and things like that. Overall, thoroughly recommend this show noticeable difference that you know it looked better too there was less light streaking problems yeah, yeah. and mm. the crowd were lit better and Ventura was awesome mm. it was, as always yeah everyone had very luminous <laughs> lights <laughs> yeah. very enjoyable pay-per-view it's weird having only four matches I probably would have wondered if they had took five minutes from each match and made a fifth match yeah I think I'd agree with that but overall yeah I'm very happy one sitting as well you know yeah um, Watched it in one sitting. I can't yeah. say that about any other pay per view. Yeah. Also, you actually watched this <laughs> yeah, in one sitting. I watched it yesterday. Uh, like that. Like that. To uh, me, go show you how good the show was. Like the fact that you could sit down for what two hours. Mine was nearly three hours, and I didn't move off my couch for three hours straight. I think left. I might have stopped for like ten minutes or something, then went back into it. But no, that was brilliant. This is Orndorff's last WWF pay per view appearance as he delayed surgery on his right arm uh, so he could finish his very lucrative run against Hogan. Afterwards, he got the surgery, but delaying it so long, he'd, cur- he'd caused permanent nerve damage. He did return for a quick stint, managed by Humperdinck, and much like Ken Pateri, feuded with the Heenan family until bowing out. 
So this is also King Kong Bundy's last pay-per-view appearance until he resurfaces in 1994, eh? Um, <laughs> as part of the Million Dollar Corporation, and then he faces Taker the following year. Ah, the 80s were awesome, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure, like, because sometimes I think we're just old and bitter, and then I go watch something from the Attitude Era or something from, yeah, like what we're doing now, and it's like, no, no, this was fantastic. The amount of talent was unreal. Though. Yeah. We yeah, were just, just incredible. The character strength and the roster depth and things hadn't been worn out at this point. You know, you know, now like every six months, they Vince does some form of screw job. Like mm. you know, like back in the eighties, that shit didn't happen. Like, you know, like it was clean finishes. You, you can have fifty guys on your roster, and forty nine of them are very good, but you've still got that one guy. You know, and that doesn't happen today. You don't really get. Feuds as well. This is like the thing that was endemic in the eighties. Like this is when the match happens, and that's it. If you lose it, that's the end of it. Yeah. Like Steamboat and Savage WrestleMania three. Savage lost. That's the end of it. Too bad you've lost. On to the next thing. That's you right. Because mm. um, that feud wouldn't, you know, that match wouldn't be so famous if they wrestled the next night on Raw. Yeah. You know. You either win it at the pay per view, or that's it. You know? Yeah. The problem with today is like storylines don't end. Today they they pet they out. keep yeah yeah it's just yeah. they outstay their welcome like that's it's problem with, also it's like and to keep the feuds going you know wrestler A wins month one wrestler B wins month two as like you're you're both winning on each other therefore no one is a better man so no one really gets over hmm. so you know it's just massive problems with just the whole way wrestling is done today it's quite sad. It's well when we were looking at last week. What have we got? Ten hours of wrestling, or a three-hour RAW, two SmackDown, one if you count Superstars and NXT still going. It's so unfortunately. And what else? Three-hour pay-per-view. So holy shit! I watched NXT last night in seven minutes. <laughs> 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 anyway, no, 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 um, like, like well, how many tag teams do we have in today's division? Like, I you'd be lucky to have ten between the two companies. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what I'm like, Can we name Ring 10? of Honor have a decent tag team? They're, they're not on TV, I can't count them. Yeah, they're coming to TV, though. Mm, what kind Again. of TV, like? Uh, they were bought out by a TV company. That like. TV's like in like 10% of homes or I know, 20%. I know. You know, I, you've yeah. got to... I suppose it can be in any less than HD Net was in, though. Mm. You know? Um, so, like, okay, can we just name some tag teams in WWE and TNA? Let's start with WWE. Okay, go on. So, who's on Raw? Okay. Otunga and what's-his-face. The Nexus, right? Otunga and... And when's the last time Otunga has been around? He's the tech champ, right? Is he? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Otunga and other fella. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, Mag- Magillabuddy. Magillabuddy, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're tight champs. Yeah, they're oh, tight champs. Stadium. So, them. All right, let's just, just name the ones you can think of in WWE. Uh, it's a, the Usos. Yeah, Gabriel and Red Hair. Slater, Slater yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll edit out the pauses here. No, we shouldn't. <laughs> this is the whole point of it, like. Uh, does Santino Kozlov count? Yes, yeah. Okay, that's, that's four. Santi- yeah, four. And, like, none are proper tag teams, like. None are the somethings. You know, yeah. it's like... I, I give it to core, uh, the core tag team, because at least they've the core, been tagging. The core problem. I know, but they're, them as a tag team, they've been tagging for a while now. Yeah. They, yeah. they never wrestle singles, though, do they? And they still help. They still come out to each other, like yeah. You know, they still come on each other. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. Like okay, I, so I, I can't think of any more. Four in WWE. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, okay, so who do we have on in TNA? You beer money. Well, well, yeah, yeah. yeah you, know, you know, one's I'm injured. Still, yeah. You know, you've still got the guns, like. I know, one's I know, I know, but come on. Yeah. Okay. So that's two. Ink Ink. Are they still on TNA? Well, they haven't been on in the last few weeks, but... Yeah, okay, okay, there's three. They're a tag team. Yeah. The Mexicans. Mexican-American. Me- me- are they a tag team? Yes, they are. Have they been tagging together? They've had a few tag matches. I'm sure they're not singles, but... Well, they're, they're a group, group, but there's like... Two... Tag. There's like a women's oh, yeah, oh, tag okay, I'll, I'll look at and see. Come on, that's four. The British lads. They're, British. They're, they're back. One more have we got ten. Gunner and Murphy? Nope, nope. Oh. Murphy's gone. 
Is he? He's coming. Yeah. Hmm. Hardy Boys? Oh, the books. Books. They still have a job. They are back together with no explanation. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there you go. There's ten. Yeah, there's ten. There's ten. Only took us five minutes <laughs> to wrap up that up. <laughs> a couple of those are, hmm. Holy shit. Oh, Great. All right. Let's uh, head over to the Wrestling is Awesome segment. All right. So uh, this week, let's have a look at Billy Gunn in Sabrina the Teenage Witch. Oh, I remember watching this when I was like 12. Wrestling is awesome. 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 I came to play. There's a place to play. Time for you to get down on your knees. And now for the most sacred moment of the wedding ceremony. The ring. I don't have it. I didn't bring a ring. What's the ring? The father of the bride will now wrestle the father of the groom for the right of his daughter to marry his son. Okay, now the wedding's just getting weird. Don't worry. You can take him. Me? You're my second. And I'm protected by the Hubade Society. <laughs> Please fight for me. If you don't win, I can't marry Laird, and I just can't imagine life without Laird. Uh, 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 uh. But you can imagine life without me? Ladies and gentlemen, in this corner, weighing 267 pounds, the father of the groom, Xavier the Avenger Prescott. Part of weddings always gets me. And in this corner, at 110, Sabrina hasn't got a nickname, Spellman! What do I do? Go for his weak point. Which is where? Don't let him pin you with the match is over. Go, Sabrina! Kick him! Down to die! Really? This is a wedding! Whoever catches the wrestler gets married next. <laughs> That's it. Next wedding, I'm just sending a gift. <laughs> Great. Your slip is shown. <laughs> this isn't right. I can't just sit here and watch while poor Annabelle loses her love. Not to mention Sabrina getting filet. Annabelle, I'm going in the ring. I'm so glad I spent three hours doing my hair. <laughs> yes! Saved by Daniel Boone! It's Daniel Boone! <laughs> Sorry. No! <laughs> Please stay down. I'm glad you won. With my other son, I got beat up, and I've got gypsies as relatives. <laughs> so next time on RSW Review, we got the 1988 Royal Rumble. First ever pay-per-view that wasn't a pay-per-view. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so signing off to Smee J Hunter and with V1. All right, take See care. See you next time, lads. There's no women.
was amazing by this capacity crowd. More like the odd couple to me. He's got two dogs out there, not just one. He's got two dogs to walk tonight before he goes back to the hotel or wherever the heck when Lonnie's gone. Oh, look at that! Oh, no! His hand will be chased up by that butt! That dog should not be allowed to ring! But Tilda's going to get a ass ring! And he took off like a shot! Boy, she knows. I've been chased by that butt, you know, my son. That flea infested butt chased me one time. I know how this man feels. Humiliated in front of these people by that scrounge mutt. Oh, she's going after him again. I wish she'd take a chunk out of Danny Davis. That's unbelievable. You wish he would do what, Monsoon? Take a chunk out of Danny Davis. Absolutely. That's who deserves it. Danny Davis. Uh, oh, there she goes again Look after that the hit. I don't blame these guys. Say what you want. That dog can have uh, some kind of distemper or something. Who knows? Get that dog out of here. 20,000 plus enjoying every moment of it here in Toronto's Maple Leaf Gardens. And the hitman saying, yeah, let me give me a shot. Let me put the boots to him. Nobody's enjoyed it more than you, Monson. I saw no, that I smile on your so. face after that dog went after that poor Anvil Nightheart, and then you start talking about Danny Davis being bitten. That's sick. Well, did my, did my eyes deceive me, or did I not see you standing and applauding when Danny Davis was? In the I game? happen to admire the, the young career of this Danny Davis. It's men like him that this country was based upon. The men with the guts to make decisions in life. That's what I like, people like him. Well, Danny Davis has come under so much scrutiny here in the past several months in the World Wrestling Federation that it wouldn't surprise me if we don't see too much more of him in the very near future. Where is the Colonel? Well, I guess you're referring to Colonel Jimmy Hart? Absolutely. Well, from what I understand, Colonel Jimmy Hart, Bobby the Brain Heaton, and Mr. Fuji are in a meeting, and there's big time talk going around between these three men. Please. I understand they are having dinner in New York City at this very moment, discussing some upcoming matches. You understand? So there. The three you want to know? I'll tell you. The three of those guys together couldn't get locked up. Oh boy. Two thousand comedians out of work up there, huh? Gonna have this half what next to me. Davy boy, starting out here, it looks like with the hitman. No, oh, look at the anvil. He says, "I want to start, please." Let me start. You know, we'll have to have a match here between the Anvil and the Hitman. No, no, no. They're very close. They're very close friends. And that they're also a very awesome and devastating team. The Hart Foundation is a great team. There's no question could about that. Could be champions any night. Any given night, any given month, any given year. These guys could win titles. Something that has eluded you and your dream team. Oh, you're going to get it. You know, you're going to get it. Really cruising, pal. The hitman complaining about something. Maybe you should go up there and uh, manage these guys. John, well, uh, you're right at home doing that. I very well may here. You never know what I'm going to do. As long as that mutt's out of here, I may have to uh, lend a helping hand here as far as the brains here, as far as interjecting of something. Oh, see, that. You Get see that JYD here. standing outside that ring out there? There's a minute six. He's a sick man at JYD. These people love him. I admire him. I why. Complaining about a hair pull when, in fact, it was obvious that there wasn't any. Got about 47 pounds of bro cream on his head. Who's that? The hitman. Wow, little devil, do you, they say. Look at Davis now getting on the case. That's good. Of Davy Boy. He never touched sure. the guy's hair. Sure he did. What's the matter with you? From where I see it, that's exactly what happened. You tell him, Danny Davis. You tell him. Front face lock by the hitman. Danny Boy tried to pick him right up, but it's awful hard to do from that position. There's Danny Davis making sure that there is a uh, no choke, no choke log, and all there. Now, there's the now. power of Danny Boy. 
Oh, Sits him right on that top turn. Oh, look at that. Oh, man. Talk about insult. That is the height, the height in pro wrestling of embarrassing your opponent, slapping him in the kisser. As if to say, you know. Tag made as the anvil steps in. I, th I thought the hitman would be very upset. He was upset. So upset that he went right over and tagged. Yeah, he'll get he'll get he'll get even with this line pretty soon. Look at this also. Do you see why he's intimidated that uh, Mr. Uh, Nightheart? Jim the Anvil Nightheart, the powerhouse. Ooh, is he ever? On his heart foundation. Cornerstone. Look at ooh, that. Ooh, nobody awesome. budged. <laughs> oh, he's laughing right in yeah. the face of Davey Boy. He says, do it again if you want. <laughs> He made him take a couple of steps back, but nothing serious. How strong is this guy now, Monsoon? Uh-oh, uh -oh. stalemate. The irresistible force meeting the immovable object here in Toronto's Maple Leaf Gardens. Oh, nice single leg check. Takes more than brute strength. It takes brains, Johnny V. Well, that's something that this slimy doesn't have, so I can predict a victory here for the Heart Foundation. Denny Davis telling JYD to make sure you stay there and wait for the bus, pal. Davis breaking the hole now good. because he should have. He should have broke that hold up, which is very good. Reached the bottom rope. Nothing gets by Danny Davis, Marshall. What's the problem now? Why is he stopping the match? Because the guy has some equipment malfunctions there. There is no timeout in the world of professional wrestling. Well, I think his shoelace was undone. All right, now we're back to the action. Look at the dog waiting with bated breath to get into this matchup. Yeah, he's got some breath, all right. See, my pulling what hair? No, 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 I can see it right now. This guy was pulling his hair, Neidhart's telling uh, Danny Davis. And that's exactly what happened. He's telling him, stay off the man's hair. The anvil doesn't have any hair, John. Well, he's got enough. Well, maybe he said stay off his uh, goatee. There's the oh. tag made. Here comes your buddy. JYD stepping in. Oh, listen to him. He goes a mile a minute. Yeah. Once he's inside that ring, he's sure talking he up a storm. Sure is. He's jiving all the time, isn't he? Oh, he tried oh. to pull a dog's hair. I love what it. Hair? There's nothing up there. Inside or out. Oh, man. You got a big chunk of that Jim the Anvil Nightheart's Goatee. Get on him, Danny Davis. Things not going too well at this particular point in time for the Hart Foundation. Well, all they're doing is stirring these guys up. Look out, wide open. And the dog's out of the way. And the hitman oh, goes sprawling onto the runway here. Oh, look at this. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Ooh, Anvil says. Why is Danny Davis warning junkyard dog for because what reason he, he's been pulling hair because he's been uh, hitting with a clenched fist he's been pulling trunks because he's stupid oh boy he's stupid huh if he's stupid i'm uh i'm frightened his grandmother hey listen let me tell you something you stick to the action here don't be so biased i like to call him as i see them go down johnny v well and you better do it because you haven't been doing it so far back into the corner now Notice JYD stayed away from the quarter of uh, Jimmy of uh, Bret Hart over there. Oh, look uh -oh. at Danny Davis putting his hands uh -oh. on the junkyard dog. I don't believe that. Kind of Give me a balance. break. He lost his balance there, JYD. Lost his balance. The guy had him hooked. The referee hooked his arm. Did he? I kind of thought he lost his balance. Oh. Now that's the kind of counts I like. Nice and fast. One, yeah. two, three. Supposed to be a one second between counts. There was none there. I thought there was one second. I thought it was two seconds. Dog's in trouble. He's in the wrong quarter. Here in Toronto is a hard foundation, a master of deceit. That's a mistake. He's gonna he didn't do his homework. He, he didn't do his homework. The punch didn't affect him at all. Champ going on from this capacity crowd, JYD. He's trapped now in the wrong corner. Get in there, Anvil, if you can, help him. He's trying to get out of there. Danny Davis quick to lay the count on the Davy boy. And there was no ducking out of the way of that one. 
Tag is made. You got two of those guys in the ring at one time. JYD and, they, and uh, what do you call Davey Boy. Nobody there to count. That's it. That's the way. Move them back. Ooh. What a big sledgehammer from Jim the Anvil Nightheart. That's right, Danny. After the damage is done, go over there and tell no, the guy to stay out. He's doing his job. Out. No, come on. He warned him. Inverted atomic drop laid on Davy Boy Smith. And now he's See? in trouble. Now he puts back JYD. He's keeping law and order. Sure. Making sure it's uh, done here. There goes Davy Boy right out onto the ramp. Oh, look at that. Give me a break. Wow. The hitman went over there and threw himself down to distract Danny Davis, making him think that the junkyard dog had done something to him. In the meantime, they're going to work on Davy Boy. Danny Davis is telling this man here, JYD. Who did absolutely nothing. He's told him to make sure you stay in your corner like you're supposed to and hold on to the rope. Danny Davis doesn't need anybody to make a fool out of him. He can make a fool out of himself. Says you, brother. I think he's a fine man and a real asset to the WWF. Ooh, picked him right up by his wig. Can't even keep his shirt in his pants. The Anvil doing the number right now on Davy Boy. Ducks underneath that. Oh, look oh, at that. Moves. Where was Davis looking then? Well, he tripped. This uh, this Englishman tripped on the uh, on the turnbuckle there on the apron somehow. Another quick two count. Boy, this is some team here. This Hart Foundation. One compliments the other. David Boy needing desperately to make a tag here. Oh, look at that nice crucifix. Oh, What's that? Danny Davis doing? Why isn't he counting? Because Nightheart's not back in the corner. Oh, look at that. Would well, you see the difference in that count? No, oh, I don't understand what your problem is here. Hey. He's got to make sure he's in the corner. Brad Hart on top of the situation here. 18 or 20,000 plus here in Toronto know exactly what I'm talking about. However, you who've been around the game of professional wrestling for over 15 years do not. Well, I'll tell you what, I, I call it as it is, and there's nothing there that I don't agree with. You better have your prescription changed. Well, I may. I very well may have my prescription changed. This capacity crowd expressing my sentiments exactly. What are they saying out there? That's what I thought they were saying. Yes. Something Bear with the uh, barn yard animals' uh, problems. Okay, back to the action here, baby. Jim the Anvil Nightheart with that bear hog on the Englishman. Of course, you know it's Davy Boy Smith, JYD, offering some encouragement, but it's to no avail. Get it back, Danny Davis. Very good. I've heard the term of losing your shirt in the match, but Danny Davis is about to very well do that. Huh. I said that earlier on. He doesn't even look like a referee. Oh, he is. I give him a lot of credit. Look at this. Turning his back on the action now to give the hitman an opportunity to come in. There was no tag made. If you don't see a tag, you're not supposed to allow it. Well, that's what they said. Oh, what an uppercut by Bret Hart. Irish Whitman, look at oh, oh, the backdrop. It'll bring rain. Almost a three count as Danny Davis didn't waste any time getting down there. What an uppercut. Englishman in trouble. Bret Hart could be putting him away here any minute. Sleeper hole right in the center of the ring. Danny Davis asking, asking that Limey. Oh, come on. Give it up there, you. Give it up, you fish and chipper, you. Davy Boy, definitely not a quitter. Look at this. He's right underneath oh, the chin there. That's a choke hole. That's, that's a deliberate choke hole. You see from this angle what's going on there. You got reach your hand under there and take a look. That is a legitimate sleeper hole. Nothing to do with a choke hole. That's it. That's it. That's it. Oh. But Davy Boy is fighting this thing. 
As he will have to do because he's not going to get any assistance from Danny Davis. Look at his power display. Oh, rams him right into the corner. Both men are down here momentarily, but I think that the Bret Hart suffered the uh, least of that injury. Danny, with an opportunity to make a tag, he'd better do it. He's a tough man out there, that Bret Hart. Reversal as the hitman goes in. Whoa! Oh, look at this press slam. Oh, oh my he Lord. Them. Did you see what happened there, Monsoon? Oh. I think Bret, Bret Hart's voice is going to be so high, he'll be, he'll be able to sing with uh, Bravarotti after this one. Look at Davey trying to get over there to make the tag as the hitman is definitely in trouble. He'll be the king of the high seas. And the dog is anxious to get in there. There's the tag. And here comes the anvil. He's not legal in the ring. Look at Danny Davis. What's he doing? He's staying out of the, out of the way. This is like I would do. That's what he's doing. He's doing nothing. He's saying, Come here, baby. Come here, baby. He's doing nothing, Johnny. Well, Absolutely he should be doing nothing. something. I, I agree with you there. Double knock and knocker coming up. Oh, I heard of the heart. Head to head. Now that's heart to heart. And there goes the anvil out onto the runway. It's just Bret Hart and JYD now. The hitman in a whole lot of trouble here in Toronto. Perhaps the power slam. Oh, yeah. He nailed him with it. Down for the count. Oh, the anvil came in out of nowhere. Nice piece of work. And Davey there, Boy man. on his case All immediately. Right. All four men inside the ring right now. That away, Nightheart. Get rid of that lining. Small package here by Bret Hart. JYD is down. Hey, wait a minute. Do you see that? Oh, look Did at you see that? Now. Hey! Hey! That Davey Boy Smith turned the guy over. That's illegal. What about that one, Monsu? Well, Danny Where Davis, are you, Monsu? Danny I Davis, you. in fact, thought that it was the anvil who was putting the pinning combination on the JYD, and it was the other way around. I never you heard your winners, the team of TV Boy Smith and Highway Chuck Robert, Yard. Man. Dog. Danny you Davis made a big mistake here, which really worked to the advantage. I'll tell you what something, Monsoon. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a second here. What's he saying? Danny Davis, oh, look hey. at Matilda, she's going after everybody. He's doing what? Matilda cleaned house with everybody. I love it. I wish the people would write in here and get this dog out of this WWF. That animal has no way of blowing around the ring. Boy, Danny Davis really made a big blunder here as he thought he was giving the edge to the Hart Foundation when in fact he gave the victory to the Junkyard Dog and Davey Boy Smith.